All right. Um, hey, everyone. So today we're going to be talking about language modeling. Um, this is the second lecture of CS 685. And um, language modeling is a core NLP task that's becoming increasingly more important over the last couple of years. Um, specifically nowadays, uh, state of the art models for any downstream NLP task, basically all of them use net language modeling in some way. Um, and this relates to the transfer learning paradigm that we discussed in the previous lecture. Language modeling is commonly used as a self-supervised component of that paradigm. So we'll talk more about um, what language modeling is, how it traditionally has been approached. Uh, this lecture kind of serves as an introduction to basic probability and evaluation of language models as well. Um, and just as a roadmap for next week's lectures, we're going to be diving into neural language models, how we train them, the backpropagation algorithm, and so on. So that'll be the second week of our background unit. Um, all right, so before I get into the uh, content of this lecture, I wanted to answer a couple of questions that uh, people have brought up on Piazza and the anonymous form. So the first is regarding the format of the midterm exam. So again, we are thinking of having uh, a take home exam where you have 48 hours upon the time that we release the exam to complete it. Uh, and this will be an open book and open internet exam. Um, someone brought up that they're concerned about uh, people forming groups, even though this is a violation of the honor code and working on the exam together. Um, we've come up with a couple of ways to uh, lessen the chance that this happens, or at least this is productive for those students. Um, but at some level, we're relying on you to, you know, be faithful to the honor code and um, just don't cheat. I mean, it's hard for us to enforce all of these things with a remote exam, but, um, you know, uh, just, just don't do it. And we will try and make it hard on you, <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, you should still follow the honor code, of course. Uh, okay, so um, another question was with regard to the final project group size. Um, so uh, as in past semesters, um, because of the relatively large enrollment of the class, these will all be group projects with very few exceptions. So I've talked about, um, you know, PhD students doing NLP related research as the main exception that I've allowed in the past. Um, but in the vast majority of cases, you should form groups of four, which will leave us with around 30-ish groups. Uh, this has been a great size in the past to allow us to um, give you, you know, detailed enough feedback such that it's useful for you to um, guide your projects and write up your final report. Um, so uh, if you haven't checked Piazza, there's a post on how to form teams. There's basically a thread where you can post things and try and find other teammates. It's often productive if you have a particular idea uh, in mind for the final project to write maybe a couple of sentences about it um, and see if anyone else is interested in working on that particular idea. Um, and note that you don't have to um, form your own team. If you don't want to or don't find anyone you want to partner up with, then uh, we will randomly assign you to a team. But um, there's a Google form you can submit if you've managed to find your own team of four. And you should submit that form by September 4th. Otherwise, we'll uh, randomly assign you to a group of four. Um, okay, so homework zero, your first homework is going out today and it's also due on September 4th. So you have two things to, to do by then. Um, it is intended to be more of an introduction to the basic um, coding, especially in PyTorch. And so if you have a limited coding or math background, I know some of you are in linguistics programs, I would highly encourage you to start early. Um, for those of you who have prior experience with NLP or machine learning, this homework might seem relatively straightforward, uh, and it is intended to um, basically get everyone on the same footing. So when we start exploring more advanced models, um, everyone will know the you know basic building blocks of the implementations. All right. 
So let us switch over to our uh, main topic for today. So I, I wanted to briefly review the transfer learning paradigm to motivate why language modeling is such an important task. Um, and so let's say I want to train a model for the task of sentiment analysis. We already talked about in the last lecture how sentiment analysis is uh, a task that a lot of companies care about, right? There, there's a lot of money put into developing these um, models that are better predictive of what people are saying about, say, a company's product. So in the past, the standard way of doing this was I would... Um, train a supervised model on a, a labeled training data set. So I would crawl, say, IMDB, which contains a bunch of movie reviews. So there's like a paragraph or two about the movie and then a corresponding score from 1 to 10. Um, so I might collect, you know, 100,000 or so of these pairs of uh, review and score and use this as supervision to train a model to um, given a review, predict a score. So this is how it was done in the past, where the model only gets access to um, data from the supervised training set. But um, recently, we've switched over to this transfer learning paradigm, which allows us to take advantage of a lot more data than just what is available in our IMDB training set. So the first step of this transfer learning pipeline is where language modeling comes in. So I basically take a ton of unlabeled text. And as we discussed before, uh, this kind of text can be just all over the internet, right? The common crawl is an example of, uh, you know, a dump of a ton of web pages on the internet. There's trillions of words available. And we would hope that if we have a model that has access to all of those tokens and is able to learn um, representations of the language in, in those uh, unlabeled documents, then it would learn a lot of useful linguistic properties that would help it when performing the do downstream task of sentiment analysis, right? If you think about sentiment analysis, um, some examples can be fairly complicated, right? If I say something like, um, I really like the acting, but the plot was super horrible. Um, this uh, review is on the whole pretty negative, um, but there's um, you know a, a bit of positive um, sentiment conveyed towards the acting. And so you might want a model that's aware of this negating uh, this contrastive conjunction, but, that kind of negates the, the goodness of this movie and shifts the focus of the sentence over to how horrible the, the plot was, right? Um, so learning complex phenomena like negation from a small set of text like you might have on IMDB is really challenging. But if we have access to you know trillions of words, maybe we see a lot of instances of negations and contrastive conjunctions, and maybe we're able to learn you know things like negation scope and um, how a negation interacts with a, a much larger sentence and so on. So um, this is kind of uh, part of the intuition behind um, this first stage of transfer learning where we take a ton of unlabeled data and we do this unsupervised pre-training. And so the way in which we do this is through self-supervision. So if you remember last time we discussed self-supervision as being a way to create labeled data out of unlabeled data. And the specific examples that we looked at were language modeling and masked language modeling. Um, so today we'll be talking about language modeling. Uh, and then the next step, which we won't be talking about today, is supervised fine-tuning. So I essentially take my giant self-supervised model that is the output of this pre-training stage, and I fine-tune it on the small label data that in this example I got from IMDB. So this is kind of taking all of the linguistic knowledge that my model has encoded in the first step on uh, as much text as you can get a hold of, and then kind of guiding it to complete this task of sentiment analysis in particular. But importantly, in transfer learning, the same base model, this um, model that you get out of the pre-training stage, can be used for many, many different downstream tasks. So you just have to change 
the data set that the, you use for fine tuning. So it could be um, sentiment as in this example, it could be question answering, um, it could be part of speech tagging, it could be any other task, but this base model can stay the same. And it's really the fine tuning phase that's changing it to specialize to some downstream task. All right, so this is the motivation and um, language modeling is uh, one of the core objectives that we use in NLP for self-supervised uh, pre-training. So language modeling um, assigns a probability to uh, any given input text. So if you think about that, it's kind of confusing, right? Why would we want to have a model that gives us a probability for a piece of text? Um, but then if you think more carefully, you might um, understand that applications such as translation and speech recognition can directly benefit from integrating language models into their pipeline. So, um, for example, in translation, if I had two candidate translations for a given source language sentence, uh, I flew to the movies and I went to the movies. Um, of course, I could use a language model to uh, rank the second one higher than the first one, right? Because uh, it's incredibly rare, unless I guess you're very rich, that you fly to the movies rather than just normally going there. Um, similarly, in speech recognition, uh, I might have an audio file of an utterance uh, that someone said, and um, I want to convert this audio file into the actual transcription, the text that they're saying. So uh, two candidate um, transcriptions could be, I saw a van, or the second one, eyes uh, of an. So they kind of sound the same, but a language model would tell us that the first one has significantly higher probability of occurring than the second one. Um, so as a side note, um, I'm posting these videos on YouTube and YouTube has this auto captioning feature that you might have seen on the first um, lecture video and it's really good. Um, I, I was looking through it and it made very few mistakes. But uh, yeah, a language model, like a, a text-based language model is a, is a key component of um, YouTube's captioning system and indeed all captioning systems. Okay, so these are like direct use cases of language models. Um, of course, the, the theme of this whole class is how we can use them in um, transfer learning setups, but we're not going to get fully into that today. All right, so um, another application of language models is autocomplete, which you use, uh, you likely use on your phones or in Google search. Um, so it's generally useful, um, but uh, yeah, in, in this class, we'll be focusing more on its uh, transfer learning usages. Okay, so um, these two examples that I've shown um, to this point, so first we have uh, the probability of an entire sentence, and then we have the probability of a word following a given prefix. So here, airport is a word that our language model is predicting when given with the prefix, I'll meet you at the. Um, these are both things that language models can do. Um, so if our goal is to compute this joint probability of a given sentence, so let's say our sentence is w1, w2, w3 to wn, this, these are the words of a sentence. Um, I can uh, decompose this joint probability into the product of multiple conditional probabilities. So um, here, uh, if I have a model that's able to compute the probability of word five, given all of the words that preceded it, the prefix, um, then I'm also able to compute the joint probability of an entire sequence. So how does that work? Uh, this is just um, kind of basic probability, the chain rule. So if we want, and here we'll look at a specific example, we have this uh, uh, fragment, its water is so transparent that, and we want to compute the joint probability of this, this fragment um, occurring. So we can use the chain rule to do this. 
Um, and if you don't remember the chain rule, if we look down here at the um, bottom most bullet, uh, it's basically saying that this joint probability is factorized into the product of conditionals. So probability of x1 times a probability of x2 given x1 times a probability of x3 given x1, x2, and then um, finally to the probability of the last word given all of the words that preceded it. So if this looks completely foreign to you, you should um, review on your own time um, basic probability uh, it'll be very useful moving forward. Oops. Okay. Um, so if we extend this to the case of language modeling, we can factorize this joint probability of W1, W2 to Wn, the sequence as a product of the conditional probabilities of each word given all of the words that preceded it. So the probability of its water is so transparent um, is the probability of its times a probability of water given its, times a probability of is given its water, and so on. Um, so hopefully you get the idea. So the high level um, thing that you need to take away from is if we set up a language model such that um, what it does is given some prefix of a text, it predicts the next word. This model allows us to compute the joint probability of any text um, through the chain rule, because we can just multiply all of these conditional probabilities. All right, um, and if you look in homework zero, uh, I use this terminology of the prefix to um, uh, refer to what the model is conditioning its prediction of the next word on. Okay, so um, there are many ways in which we can estimate these conditional probabilities. Um, and next lecture, we'll be looking at fancier and maybe more interesting from a machine learning perspective ways of doing this. But um, in this class, we'll be, sorry, in this uh, video, we'll be looking at um, what happens if we just count up the occurrences of prefixes and the words that follow them in a large corpus and then normalize. Um, so this counting and normalizing approach uh, can be very powerful despite how simple it is, um, especially if you have huge data sets. Of course, it's uh, also fundamentally limited. Um, so uh, we'll see approximations to this approach in the remaining slides. But um, you can imagine that if I wanted to predict the probability of the word the, given um, its water is so transparent that, um, I have to look in a corpus for all of the occurrences of this prefix. And this is a pretty long and maybe a relatively uncommon prefix, right? How often would you imagine observing all six of these words um, in, in a collection of documents? Probably not very many, right? Um, and what if this was instead of six words, 50 words, right? What if I was uh, or what if it was 500 words? I might never observe that segment of 500 words more than one time, even if I have the common crawl or some trillion word um, corpus as my um, as my training data. So um, this approach is infeasible how it's written here. I can't possibly just count up all the prefixes because as they get longer, I'll never get enough data for estimating all of the words that could possibly follow this. So um, we rely on the Markov assumption to simplify things. So here, instead of um, counting up the occurrences of its water is so transparent that, I'm going to approximate this with the probability of um, the, so the word immediately following this, um, given just the immediately preceding word, so that. So here, I'm completely ignoring the rest of the prefix, its water is so transparent. Um, but if I do this, it gives me a fixed size prefix, which is relatively short. And so, you know, I would in imagine there'd be many, many occurrences of the word that in a corpus, which would allow me to more accurately estimate the words that come, um, the word that comes uh, after it. Um, but, you know, just one word of context, uh, that's not very informative, right? There 
are numerous words in this prefix that are, uh, sorry, my highlighting is bad, that are more important than that, right? Maybe water and transparent contain, uh, convey the most semantic meaning of any of the words in this um, six word prefix. Uh, and if I simplify to just the immediately preceding word, I don't get either of those two words in my uh, context. So maybe a better way to do this is to take a larger number of words as my prefix. So in this uh, model, this is called a trigram model. Um, I have the last two words of context as my prefix. So transparent that. And the idea is that if I now have this word transparent, this is giving a, um, a little more constraint to what can possibly follow this, uh, this phrase. So there's a trade-off, right? Um, if I keep extending this uh, prefix size, then at some point it's going to be um, too specific, right? If I extended it all the way to this uh, six word phrase, um, I'm not going to see enough occurrences of this in my co context to accurately estimate the probabilities. But if I use too small of a context, um, then I'm ignoring a lot of information that is useful to constrain the next word. So this is the challenge of um, n-gram language modeling. But um, yeah, just a more uh, formal definition of what I just said. Um, the Markov assumption allows us to approximate this conditioning of, um, if I go back here, uh, the prefix uh, word one, word two to word i minus one and predicting word i from that. Instead of this, we're going to take the last k words of context, not all of them. So here you see we start from word i minus k and then we go all the way up to i minus one. So importantly, this assures us a fixed size prefix for every word that we're predicting. We're ignoring all of the words beyond the last k words, but we're going to hope that um, if we choose a reasonable value of k for our data set, this enables us to um, approximate these uh, joint probabilities fairly accurately. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Um, the simplest case of uh, an n-gram model is a unigram model. So here we have no context at all, right? If you look at this equation, we're not conditioning this probability of word i on anything that came before it. Um, so this is the simplest possible model. It has no context. Um, and the best that this can do is learn the uh, frequency distribution of the words in a particular data set. So you'll look at this a little more on homework zero, but um, basically if I have no context, I should um, uh, kind of upweight words that occur more frequently. So words like the or a or and, right, that occur a lot and don't necessarily have much um, semantic meaning, but um, they occur enough that I should upweight them more over rare words, right? This is basically all a unigram model can learn. Um, and so this is an example of text that you can generate from a unigram model. You'll notice that it's not grammatical, but it does have a lot of instances of these highly frequent um, words like uh, the in and so on. Um, OK, so as an aside, um, an important use case of language modeling is generating text. And we'll look at this more in um, a three week unit later on in this class. Um, but one fundamental thing to understand is how we can use language models to produce text. So if I have a model like this, this is basically giving me a probability distribution. Um, actually, let's not look at the Unigram model. So if I have a model like this, this is giving me a distribution of the next word conditioned on some context, right? And so I can generate text from this model by feeding it some context and then sampling from the probability distribution that I get over the next word. Um, so uh, we can, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the following lectures and a lot more about it in our unit on text generation. But just know that um, it's fairly straightforward to sample from um, these distributions and there are there is a considerable NLP research devoted to 
better me methods of sampling from these models to ensure things like diversity or um, faithfulness to some input context or stuff like that. So we'll look more at those papers later. All right, um, so one of the things that I've discussed in the previous slides is that as we add more um, context, right, more words to our um, n-gram model, a higher value of k, um, we get better at approximating these probabilities, but this kind of breaks down once the uh, n-gram order increases to such a point where we can't count um, we can't accurately estimate the, the probabilities because they're just so sparse. We, we can't count up um, all of the occurrences of these things in a corpus. So uh, if you look at um, a language model trained on Shakespeare, um, varying the value of k, uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4, um, we see that the Unigram model um, is... Uh, of course, just like we saw before, completely ungrammatical. Um, a bigram model, so this is conditioning on only the last word of the uh, prefix and ignoring everything else, so the immediately preceding word. You can see that it is more grammatical. Why dost thou, oh, why dost stand forth thy canopy? You know, it's not great, but um, it's definitely um, noticeably better than the Unigram model, which you know generates the word which followed by a period. Um, if you look at the trigram model, now we're getting um, you know even better. Fly and will rid me these news of price. So this doesn't make sense, but at least it's uh, somewhat more grammatical than the bigram model. And finally, uh, the foregram model um, is uh, well. I can't really tell if it's better or not than the trigram model, but it's certainly better than the unigram model. So this is the effect of increasing the order of your n-gram model. Um, and as I said, um, we can keep extending this, right? We can keep e extending our uh, prefix size, but um, at some point we're going to have to stop because we're not going to be able to count up um, enough occurrences of all of these longer prefixes. Uh, and the fact that we have to cut it off at some point in these n-gram models, cut off the prefix, means that we're just fundamentally unable to model long-distance dependencies. So if the prediction of the next word depended on something that happened 50 or 100 words ago, there's no way for these models to um, take that into account when they're producing a probability of what comes next. So here's an example. The computer, which I had just put into the machine room on the fifth floor, crashed. And I'm trying to predict this word crashed, but if I have uh, a trigram model, I'm only going to get fifth floor as my prefix. And so crashed is likely very low probability under this model. But if I had something um, that took into account the larger context, maybe crashed would be higher probability. So the next video, we'll, we'll start looking at some models that um, they still have this, this issue, but it's not um, as bad as with n-gram models. So we'll look at models that have um, context sizes of like 1,024 uh, words. Um, so definitely better, but still not capable of modeling dependencies across entire documents. OK. So you can look forward to that, but um, for the rest of this lecture, we'll focus on how do you actually train um, one of these n-gram models. So these are very straightforward. As I mentioned before, all they um, require is uh, basically counting and then dividing by uh, other counts. So we'll look at the bigram model here. Remember that the bigram model is predict word i given just what word i the uh, uh, word i minus one, so the word that immediately preceded word i. So how I'm going to do this is count up all occurrences of word i followed by word i minus one. So this is the bigram, this two word phrase. And I'm going to divide by all occurrences of the first word in this, uh, this two word phrase, word i minus one. So let's look at a concrete example. Here I have three sentences that form my training corpus for this language model. I am Sam, Sam I am, and I do not like green eggs and ham. 
You'll notice that there are these special symbols, uh, S and end S. So this is the start of sequence symbol and the end of sequence symbol. So it's important to model things like the, this because if I don't have, for example, the end of sequence symbol, I'm never going to be able to terminate a sequence if I'm generating from my language model. And I want to be able to measure the probability of uh, you know, uh, this, when will this sentence terminate, right? So it's important to have these symbols in here when you're, when you're doing language modeling. Um, okay, so let's uh, go over how to count and divide. Um, <laughs> so here, if I'm interested in the bigram probability of I given the um, start of sequence symbol, it's pretty straightforward. I look for all occurrences of the start of sequence symbol, so I see three of them, and this is going to be my denominator. There's three of them. And then I look for all of the words that immediately follow that start of sequence symbol. So I see I, Sam, and I. So two of the three times uh, the start of sequence symbol is followed by I. So my bigram probability here is two thirds. Um, so let's take a look at one of these ones that is currently a question marks. So what is the probability of Sam given am? So like before, I'm going to look for all occurrences of the word am. So I see two of them. And in one case, am is followed by Sam. In another case, am is followed by the end of sequence symbol. So the probability is going to be one half, right? One of those two times I saw Sam following am. So I can do this for um, you know, all of the different conditional probabilities that I can estimate in this, uh, in this, with this training data. And one thing at this point to mention is that um, we often refer to word types and word tokens when we're talking about um, text data. So a word type is a unique word in, a, in the vocabulary of our training data. So here, my word types are I, uh, am, Sam, um, do not like green eggs and ham, and the start and end um, sequence symbols. So this is basically my vocabulary. Um, and these are unique words, right? A token is an occurrence, any occurrence of any of these word types in the training data. So um, this uh, occurrence of I is a separate token, this occurrence of I is another token, this occurrence of I is another token. Um, so these are non-unique occurrences of the word types. So basically types refer to the things that are um, unique in your vocabulary and tokens refer to all of the occurrences in your training data set of those types. All right. So let's uh, go beyond this um, Dr. Seuss example. I'm tired of reading those sentences. <laughs> uh, so there's a, a larger study, which you've seen in your reading, also on um, this Berkeley restaurant project sentences data set. So these are real um, sentences about restaurants, um, people asking for advice on where to eat. So let's say I want to estimate a bigram model on this data set. Um, and here I've shown just a subset of the bigram table for this data set. Since it's a real data set, the vocabulary is um, far larger than, um, far bigger than uh, eight word types. But uh, this is just a small subset we're showing here. And so you can interpret this table as the columns are the word that we're predicting, word I, and the rows are the, um, the context word, so word I minus one. So uh, I saw 827 occurrences of I want in the data set. You can interpret it like that. So I form all of these counts and uh, by, by simply just counting all bigrams in my data set, you'll notice that there's a lot of zeros, right? The, the phrase want, want occurs zero times. Of course, you would never say want, want. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how to deal with these zeros at the end of the lecture. It is a problem that needs um, some specialized methods to, to deal with because otherwise, uh, if you imagine multiplying all these probabilities together wh when we use a chain rule, these zeros will result in zero probabilities, um, which could make the probability of a unseen sentence zero at uh, test time. And so we don't want that happening. All right, so I've counted up all these bigrams. 
And now I'm just going to divide by the denominator, right? The, the unigram count, all of the occurrences of word i minus one in this phrase, word i minus one, word i. So in my whole data set, I, uh, let's say, for example, I found that there were 2,500 occurrences of the word i. Um, and if you remember in my table from the past, I found 827 occurrences of i want. So if we divide the count of I want, 827, by the count of word I, um, I which is 2,500, uh, we get 0.33. So there's a 33% chance this conditional probability uh, want given I. Um, OK, and so we can do this for the rest of our uh, cells in our table. And note, again, that we have a lot of these zero conditional probabilities, um, which we'll we'll deal with later on in this video. Okay, um, so right, let's just review again how we use the conditional probabilities in this bigram model to estimate the joint probability of the sentence. Start of sequence, I want English food, end of sequence. So I'm just going to multiply all of the bigram probabilities uh, that I've computed in my table that uh, correspond to the sentence together. Probability of i given start of sequence times probability of want given i, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, I get 0 0.000031. So you can already see an issue with this setup, right? Um, if, I have, uh, if I want to measure the probability of a 500 word chunk of text, and I'm just multiplying these probabilities, uh, this is going to be a very, very small number, right? And then I'm going to have a lot of these uh, underflow issues if, if I start um, measuring the probability of longer and longer text. So um, the way we handle this is switch over to log space. So instead of just looking at the um, product of the raw probabilities, we're instead going to look at the sum of the log probabilities. Uh, and this makes our life much easier. So if you um, look at an example from an actual sentiment data set, so this is with a unigram model, um, if I want to measure the probability of I love, 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 love the movie, so someone really loved the movie, that, that's the sentence, um, I could multiply the raw probabilities, the raw unigram probabilities, and I would get 5.95 times 10 to the minus seventh, so very small number. Or I could add up the log probabilities and I get minus 14. So this is a much more manageable number. Um, and this is what we're going to be using um, throughout the rest of the class for all of the models that you develop that deal with language modeling or text generation. Um, you'll be working with um, log probabilities. All right, so um, we've looked at estimating this bigram model, and I just wanted to step back and um, provide some more motivation on why language modeling is such a good task for self-supervision. Um, and the primary reason is because it learns all these linguistic properties, right? So it learns things like um, to want, right? This infinitive verb construction, part of syntax and grammar. Um, it learns things about the world, right? Um, like English and Chinese. And if this was a food, um, right? It, it's something about uh, world knowledge, people wanting to eat these kinds of cuis cuisines. It learns things, again, about what words are likely to come first to start a sentence, right? I is likely to follow the part, uh, start of sequence token. Um, it learns things that are ungrammatical, so I'm not likely to see the word want after seeing another verb spend, um, and so on. So these probabilities are encoding a lot of the l layers of the linguistic hierarchy that we um, talked about in the previous lecture. And you can imagine a far more powerful language modeling encoding many, many more properties um, much more uh, in a much better fashion. So this is kind of the intuition why language modeling is um, you know, such, a, such a good task. All right, so if you're interested in training n-gram models, um, there are some existing toolkits that you can use. Um, uh, I would recommend KenLM in particular. It's, um, it's got a lot of cool smoothing features that um, we actually won't talk too much about in, in this video, but um, they are crucial to getting um, good n-gram models. 
Okay, so the last thing I want to discuss in this video is how we evaluate language models. Um, and uh, in a more general setting, how do we evaluate any sort of machine learning model? So many of you who have familiarity with machine learning um, know this paradigm of a train set, test set, um, and an evaluation metric. But um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, in essence, we set aside some large percentage of the data that we have av available as our training set. So this is going to be data that we estimate the parameters of our models on. In the case of a bigram model, this is the data that we're going to use to you know, form these count tables um, and uh, estimate these conditional probabilities by counting and dividing. So we're going to do this, that on our training set. And then we're going to have a test set, which is completely unseen. We haven't estimated any of our model parameters on it um, from training, right? So in the language modeling case, this would be maybe new reviews that are coming in um, in this or, or new sentences that I get in this restaurant um, data set that I haven't estimated on uh, my conditional probabilities on. And what I want to do is for these unseen sentences, these test sentences, sentence, <laughs> uh, this video is getting long, uh, I want to um, uh, measure the performance of my, my model on, on them using some evaluation metric that tells us how well our model generalizes to data that we haven't yet seen. Um, so uh right we're basically the intuition here is that we want uh, our model to assign a high probability to the words that we see in the test set right these are words uh, sentences that actually um, were real world sentences right that i got from my um, restaurant data set uh, and they're not just random sequences of words right so i want a model to assign a high probability to real data um, and this forms the core of our metric that we use to evaluate um, language models. So before we get into the, the specific metric, um, I wanted to put in a word of caution for all of you during your final projects. Uh, please do not train on the test set. Um, this uh, obviously inflates your score. If you uh, estimate your model using the test set, then whatever evaluation you use, it, it's going to be um, greatly inflated um, because you've seen the, the test sentences before. This is terrible science. Um, if you want a good way to get a very low score on your final project, um, you will train on your test set. Uh, if you want to get a good grade, uh, don't do this. <laughs> Okay, and people have done this in the past, um, so I wanted to emphasize it um, clearly this time to, to avoid this. Okay, so let's uh, move on to how we evaluate language models in particular. So we're going to use this metric called perplexity, which has some nice connections to information theory. But the intuition is exactly what I said before. We want um, a metric that assigns, uh, that, that basically ranks models that assign a higher probability to the test set um, higher than models that uh, assign a low probability to the test set. Um, so some intuition. Uh, let's say I have the sentence, I always order pizza with cheese and blank. Um, so a good model might put, you know, like reasonable pizza toppings like mushrooms or pepperoni or anchovies um, as uh, highly probable continuations here and put things like fried rice or just grammatically um, things that don't work like and as low probability. So we want to reward models that um, produce reasonable predictions like this on unseen sentences. Um, and uh, as some intuition, unigrams are horrible at this, right? If you look at the sentence, I always order pizza with cheese and blank, a unigram model would not produce a distribution like this because it has no knowledge of this entire context, right? So and would actually score extremely well on, uh, sorry, it would be assigned a very high probability with a unigram model, but a very low probability with something like a trigram or fourgram or fivegram model that um, gets this pizza with cheese and blank into the, the context. All right, so um, 
intuitively, I'm going to uh, score my models by the average probability uh, of the words in the test set. So I'm going to take every word in my test set and I'm going to compute its probability and I'm going to then average these conditional probabilities across the entire uh, test set. So this uh, one over M here, M is a total number of words in, in the test set. Okay, but perplexity is not that, although it's just a direct function of that. So perplexity is basically an exponentiated version of this um, averaged negative log likelihood of the, uh, the words in the test set. Um, so you can see the equation here, but um, intuitively minimizing perplexity is the same thing as maximizing the probability of the uh, test set. So we use um, perplexity because it, it has some nice connections to information theory. So in particular, you can view it as a branching factor. Um, so this means like given some context, how many words can feasibly follow this, um, this context, this prefix? So as some intuition, uh, let's suppose our training data just contains random digits. There's no distinct pattern um, in them at all. Uh, and then we have a model that um, just assigns a probability of 0.1 to every digit in the vocabulary. So if you compute the perplexity of this model, um, you'll see that it's equal to 10. And so this kind of corresponds to the branching factor, right? So given any prefix in this data set, um, I'm going to have 10 possible options to continue this, this prefix. So um, ideally, uh, a good language model will have a smaller branching factor, right? That means that it's more constrained um, and it has a more, uh, it has a better idea of what's going to follow this prefix. So the lower the perplexity, the lower the branching factor, the better the model. And we can see this if we compare um, n-gram models with different orders, right? Different lengths of the prefix. So a unigram model trained on the Wall Street Journal gets a perplexity of 962, which is really high. Uh, you can see that just including one word of context when you condition the when you're computing these conditional probabilities dramatically lowers the perplexity to 170. And um, then a trigram model that has two words of context has 109 perplexity and so on. So um, the general rule is uh, the larger your data set, the higher number of words in your context, the larger order of n you can condition on. Um, if you have a small data set, you might not be able to get around uh, just a bigram or trigram model. Um, this uh, general rule doesn't really apply to the models that we'll be discussing um, next class. It's mainly for um, n-gram models. Okay, so we will conclude today with um, just a high level discussion of what you do with all those zero probability, um, the zero counts that we saw in that table and the, the z conditional probabilities that are also zero as a result of these counts. Um, so this kind of breaks perplexity, right? Because if I have a, a bigram that's unseen um, in my test data, right? So I've never seen it before at training time, it's gonna have a count of zero, a conditional probability of zero, then any uh, text that includes that bigram is also going to have a probability of zero just because we're using a chain rule, right? So we're going to multiply um, all of these conditional probabilities together. And if any one of them is zero, the whole probability is going to be zero. And we can't compute perplexity as a result because we can't um, divide by zero. So in n-gram models, dealing with these zero probabilities is um, very, very important. Um, and just to motivate this, if you look at all of the plays and poems that Shakespeare has written. Um, first of all, you see that uh, there are 884,000 tokens. So again, these are the um, all of the occurrences of words in the data set, but there's only 29,000 word types. Um, so these are the unique um, types. And we can extend this notion of token and type to bigrams as well. So Shakespeare produced 300,000 unique bigrams, so bigram types. But um, there are 844 million possible bigrams that he could have um, written, and those, uh, the vast majority of those are unseen, 99.96%. 
So we're not going to go into the actual algorithms that are or methods that are used to um, deal with this issue, but I just wanted to leave you with some intu intuition on um, what happens. So I'll skip over this, um, which is essentially that um, what we do is we steal count or we steal probability mass from the bigrams and the, the that we've actually observed in our training data set and we give the stolen mass to things that have zero counts so we're essentially artificially inflating the counts of all zero probability um, bigrams or trigrams in our data set but this helps us get around the problem of having zero probability sequences at test time just because we haven't observed a single bigram or trigram. Um, so you can imagine that there could be issues if we steal too much probability mass from the observed data and assign it to the unobserved, um, the zero bigram probabilities. Um, and similarly, there are issues if we steal too little mass um, and so there have been many different smoothing approaches proposed to um, get around these issues. Like maybe in some cases, for some words, I can steal more probability mass than others, um, all sorts of things like that. Uh, and if you're interested, the, the reading that was assigned the Jurafsky and Martin book um, it contains, uh, in other chapters, more details on various smoothing methods that um, you can look into. But for the purposes of this class, we're not going to be looking into this because the next lecture is going to focus on neural language modeling where these kinds of smoothing tricks um, aren't really applicable. Okay, so uh, again, just to reiterate, our your homework zero will be coming out today and it's due the following Friday um, on Gradescope. I will add you all to Gradescope at some point between now and then. Um, we're gonna have lectures on neural language modeling and also on backpropagation that'll be coming next week. And uh, yeah, please be, um, using Piazza to organize your final project teams um, throughout the next week. All right.